Hello and welcome to the Fish House Nation podcast. Today our guest is John Marshall from the sales and marketing firm Marshall & Hansen. Marshall & Hansen represents several of the biggest brands in ice fishing, including Markham Electronics. John, thanks for joining the show. Glad you had me on, Chris. I'm a big fan of the show. I listen to all, I spend a lot of time on the road and, and uh, podcasts are kind of our thing and ice fishing is my jam. So it uh, passes the passes a lot of miles. Yeah, nothing like podcasts for the guys who are on the road, uh, keeps everybody company. One thing I've noticed is it's really hard to listen to podcasts with somebody else in the car with you. That's almost impossible. But for, for those of you loners out there, thanks for listening. John, I wanted to have you on the show to talk about ice fishing sonar. Just about everyone who is on uh, the ice out there chasing those fish has a sonar unit, but many don't really know how they work. So first, let's talk about sonar technology itself. How does sonar work for ice fishing? Well, sonar is pretty basic. Uh, there's a lot of it out there. Um, obviously, it's kind of using sound pressure levels to detect uh, you know, what's happening below the ice. So, you know, if you think of the old sonar things that you've probably heard from, uh, uh, you know, think of Red October or something, one thing only, Vasily. I don't know if that's a movie that's from, but it's a... Uh, I, lo I love that movie. Yeah. Is that is that uh, Red October? We'll go with it. Okay. Uh, you know, you're basically sending a, a, um, a ping out and not only listening to the echoes, but also listening to the void. So the reflection of that sound comes back and registers. And that's how sonar under the ice can, or, or open water for that matter, can reflect off the bottom and uh, detail bottom content, uh, bottom density. Uh, you know, the harder the surface it is, it is the, the harder the reflection is. If it's a mucky bottom, it kind of comes back as a as a uh, weaker return, you know, and that's how the graphs and and the flashers basically show the uh, the detail of what's what's happening below there. You know, let's talk about the sonar unit itself. Probably the first thing people are going to notice with a lot of units is depth display. So when they're turning it on. It's usually the first choice they're going to get. When someone is fishing, how should they set that up? Yeah, you know, from an ice fishing perspective, we're a flasher for society, right? Flashers have always remained in the market because they were the, at, at the time the first real time sonar. And the, the, the biggest difference between like say an open water sonar and an ice fishing sonar is when we're ice fishing, we're in a stationary setting, nothing's moving. There's no waves, or there's no wind. And in most cases, uh, there's not a lot of current, right? So we're as stationary as we can be. And flashers really came on the scene hard in ice fishing and still are the top selling units for ice fishermen because it's real time. And uh, the reason I say that is, you know, the, the flashers by and large um, start with an on button that selects your depth. In most cases, you're going to turn it on and you're going to flip it to like a, a 20 foot scale. And if you see a bottom, you're done and you're ready to fish. If you don't see a bottom, you keep flipping it to the next scale up. And that's going to, you know, the first thing you want to do is make sure that you're in, in the right depth. Now, Navionics apps and, and uh, mapping for the most part uh, give people a pretty good clue of, of where they are. So they kind of taken the mystery out of that. Um, and obviously there's some sonar GPS combos out there that have taken the mystery out of that too. But if you're using a flasher, that's basically your starting point, finding the depth. And then after that, anything that you see on your on your flasher or, or or your sonar in between the bottom and the water column is going to be your presentation and that's the you know the, the other most common knob right is your gain knob and i think one thing that people need to understand about ice fishing sonar is you know whether it's a dual beam a single beam type of transducer you're drawing a cone 
angle. And that cone could be as, as narrow as eight degree or it could be as wide as 20 degree. But the, 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 the reason these are <clears throat> three color sonars is that strength of signal is determined not only by size, but by color density. And that color density is determined from the center of the cone. So you got a cone angle like this, and the density is drawn from, you know, what's happening directly below the transducer, which in an ice fishing scenario is your hole. As the fish enters from the outside edge of that cone, it's gonna start as the weakest signal. As it gets closer to the center of that cone, which is, again, your hole, you're gonna see it grow in an intensity on a Markham that's yellow, green, red. And um, you'll see that swing swim in. And once that fish becomes red, you know that it's, it's basically within a striking distance of your bait. And that's where the excitement starts. That's where the anticipation and the, and the cat, cat and mouse uh, deal goes. Now the size of that fish is gonna be dictated by how big the, the mark is. You know, and it'll start small and it'll grow in intensity, not only in color, but in size as it enters that. So getting back to that, that second knob, your gain, you always want to turn that down as low as you possibly can while keeping a consistent view of your presentation. That way, you know, anything else that comes in is bigger and more targeted. Very cool. Probably one of the most um, talked about issues when it comes to sonar is interference. Uh, it's something that kind of plagues people when they want to go out and do some fishing with other people. Uh, most sonar units have interference rejection. How does that work? Yeah, in interference um, said another way is basically crosstalk between flashers. We all grew up with walkie talkies running around the neighborhood and you could switch to private channels and, uh, and that. That's basically what interference is doing. It's switching to a different channel. Ice fishing is a communal sport. Uh, two man shelters uh, put you in close quarters with people, right? And it be, you got a fishing buddy, I got a fishing buddy. Um, we fish in pairs, we fish in groups. So it's not uncommon for you to be in close quarters with another um, ice angler. And that's, that's another big separating factor between what defines an ice fishing sonar and what defines an open water sonar. Open water uh, sonars are designed to keep a distance from maybe the trolling motor mount and the transom mount. You know, in most cases, that's a 17 to 20 foot spread. Ice fishing is going to be a lot closer to that. You know, you think of sitting in a, a flip shelter, so you're going to be four feet away, you know, from, from another guy. So you need to be able to eliminate that clutter on your dial and interference or rejection is the, the name of that game. It could be called uh, uh, clutter reduction. It could be called crosstalk elimination. The market has called it interference rejection. And how that shows up is you'll see a bunch of blips and blops on your screen and you won't be able to tell what the bottom is and what your presentation is. And typically, um, you know, eliminate, you're, you're gonna run into it. And it doesn't matter what brand of sonar, two of the same brand, two competing brands, you're gonna get it. The nice part about just about every dedicated ice fishing sonar is they've done a good job at addressing that, you know. Um, and typically, you know, if there's any words of wisdom, I would say you start with the most expensive flasher in the shack. If you're both be booping bot buttons, you're never gonna figure it out, but start with one, get that clean, see what it does to the other flasher in the area. Um, so get, get the most expensive one kind of clutter free and then switch to that one. And then you can really quickly eliminate all of that clutter and get to a pleasurable fishing situation for both people. What about cone angles? It was something that you discussed a little bit earlier, um, you know, going from a larger to a smaller cone angle. If someone's going out, they're doing some fishing, 
how should they choose which cone angle to fish with when they're going out on the water? Kind of think of it, uh, if you've got a dual beam transducer, um, you know, most, most units are equipped with either a single beam transducer or a du dual beam, you know, and you're going to pay a little bit more for a dual beam type of system, but you get a lot of, of really nice feature benefits from that. That's a big strength. Um, think of a wide beam transducer as a shotgun blast and, uh, and a narrow beam transducer as a rifle shot. Um, having, well, I'll, I'll bring some numbers into the equation. Let's say you're in 10 feet of water with a 20 degree cone. You're looking at basically a three foot area of the bottom of the lake. Um, you want to be as wide as possible when you're in shallow water. So if you're a bluegill fisherman that, or you know somebody that's going to be targeting fish in 17 to 10 feet of water or less, that's where you're going to live this winter. Um, you know, wide wide beam is probably going to be all you need. Let's say you're going to be a um, somebody that's out in the basin uh, fishing suspended crappies. It's nice to have that wide beam to take as wide of a look as possible at searching for fish and then once you find a school of crappies you can narrow that transducer down and now you're going to eliminate a lot of the fish that are on your screen but you're going to be targeting the fish that are within a striking distance of your bait so you're you know you're eliminating a lot of the fish that you see on your screen and just targeting the ones that were that are within a striking distance of it so the beam angles um, can be really deployed as a, you know, a nice uh, kind of targeting strategy. Wide and shallow water, uh, you want to get as much coverage as you can because you're calling those fish. If you're if you're in the weeds, sometimes it's nice. Um, you know, you can get a stock of cabbage that's down there and blocking your view. You know, it can shadow this area. Think of a sonar ping coming down and hitting a hard surface and reflecting up, you know, you're not going to see what's hiding below that. So sometimes going to a narrow beam if you're in thick cover is nice too. So there's, it's a nice tool to have for, for sure. A lot of companies advertise target separation. Can you tell us a little bit about target separation and how that works and why it's important? Target separation is the truest measurement of sonar performance it basically is telling you how small a unit can write you know if you think about it from a standard definition versus high definition they do that in um, pixels right um, 1080 versus what standard definition i don't even remember the numbers 480 480 640 40 by 480 or something like that yeah um so yeah, target separation is you want the smallest number humanly possible. And you know, wh where that comes into play is if your target separation say is three quarters of an inch, you could have a crappie that's sitting over here. And you've seen them on underwater cameras, Chris, you know what they look like in, in those big roaming nomadic schools. Um, you know, they're they're not just frozen like that right they're constantly doing this moving around yep and you got great underwater video i've seen some of the stuff that you do so i mean you've got visuals to that what you you know this one could be seven feet over this way and this one could be you know five feet over on this side but if they line up on the same parallel as long as those are three quarters of an inch apart in in uh, depth you're going to see two fish um same thing on the bottom when you see a you know you've you've seen walleyes come in on the bottom just belly to the bottom uh swimming sw swimming around if that fish is three quarters of an inch off the bottom you're going to see the bottom and you're going to see that fish if, if your target separation is two inches that fish has to be two inches off the bottom to mark as an individual fish so uh, target separation is basically what you want to look at at picking high performance sonar. Zoom can help out with that, and some zone, so sonars have zoom. How does the zoom function work? 
Zoom is an awesome feature, um, so much so that like on the Markham side of the world, they offer it even in their entry level flasher um, and, and in their upper end uh, digital systems. Markham, Markham's kind of feature heard around the world when they came on the scene was a patent that they came out with, which was a movable Zoom. So up until then, Zooms were locked on the bottom and uh, a nice feature for fish and perch and, and walleyes and bottom relating fish, but a lot of people fish bluegills, crappies, lake trout, other suspending fish. Now you had the ability to move that zoom anywhere in the water column and target target those fish. And when you're when you're zooming in on them, uh, like on a Markham M3 or a, an a M5, that improves your target separation. Um, so basically it splits the screen in half Everything on the right hand side of your display is the entirety of the water column. Anything on the left hand side of the screen becomes your zoom and you get a much better, clearer picture of, of that. So not only having zoom, I, but also the ability to move it so that, you know, I don't know a whole lot of guys uh, that are a single species uh, fisherman. More common definitely in open water, but like I'll go out at dawn and dusk and, and chase walleyes, but midday, you know, I'm out in the base and chasing crappies and, and doing some other other stuff. You kind of, if you're going out for eight hours, it's not going to be an eight hour grind for one species. You're going to change it up M more than often. Markham has a new digital sonar out this year called the MX-7. It's a step up from their extremely popular LX-7. Why go digital? Why go the digital sonar as opposed to that more traditional style that people have been fishing with for decades? Traditional, you know, ice fishing is a traditional sport, right? And it, uh, it's kind of like Christmas. You go to your, you go to this family's uh, house, you eat this stuff, you use the same gravy bowl every year, you do the same thing. Ice fishing isn't that, that different right we hang out with the same buddies uh we go to the same lakes and and uh in most cases we use the same stuff flashers have remained in the market forever because they were the only real time we go back to that stationary conversation we had markham's secret sauce when they launched the lx7 about nine years ago is they cracked the code to bringing uh kind of a zero latency no delay to a digital system and there's a lot of people that are still chasing um, that performance um, that gave them the confidence to come out with the MX-7 this year, which marries that up with GPS. So it's a dedicated ice fishing sonar with ice ice centric aspects, right? There's there's great out open water units out on the market, but open water units don't can have latency. You know that's okay. Because uh, you're moving, you're trolling, it, it doesn't have to be real time. An ice fishing unit has to be real time. That's the number one requirement. So that that sonar platform that Markham did with the LX7 is what exists on the MX7. And then you get the beauty of uh, pairing that with an awesome mapping partner in Navionics. So comes preloaded with the Navionics base maps, and then you got complete access to uh, the entire Navionics suite of features you can sonar chart live map your own stuff save it to the chip and there's a lot of lakes you know that even i fish um that are mapped lake master and avionics but to be able to go out and map it yourself and find that spot on the spot is pretty awesome yeah what what are some of the advantages other than than that mapping feature why would i want to go with something that's a digital sonar as opposed to something that that uh you know my my dad used to use sorry we got company hey you got a little, little pup there behind you yeah <laughs> hey, we got geese out on the bay here so he's uh he thinks he needs to go out and take care of that situation they're not allowed um that's a good question uh so flashers are a static display markham brought as much life to a static display with that movable zoom as they possibly could but what people appreciate out of being able to see zoomed windows full um 
full water column windows. When they came out with the LX7, now they could, it wasn't a static display. They could draw the picture however they wanted to, right? And I remember kind of in the early development and talks about the LX7, it was, um, why are we gonna put a circular display on a flat rectangle screen? And, and Markham felt like they had to do it because that's what we've been looking at for the last 20 years. But there's much better ways to detail what people are seeing below the ice. And uh, those are vertical and graph type views. And I remember the first time somebody tried to explain to me why graph would be awesome for ice fishing. Like those things are two separate. My graph view on open water, I understand, but you know, we can have vertical water columns, top is top, bottom is bottom, anything you see in it between is um, fish or, or your presentation. But when you bring that graph into the equation, now you get a real time response. So you're watching your jig move kind of as a heartbeat monitor, right? You got a cadence and you can do wide swings. You can hold it stationary. We've all seen fish refuse a bait that might be too aggressive. We've all dead, had better days dead sticking than we have jigging. And being able to see that on a graph and judge the fish's mood how they approach the lure it, on an ice fishing unit that's real time, that's, that's pretty impressive. So like most people I know that, that are using a digital platform like a, like a LX7 or the new MX7 have three screens up. They've got the graph screen, they've got the full vertical water column, and then they've got the zoom, zoomed in area of that. And you can monitor that all on one screen. And that's kind of the big difference between a flasher and a digital system is the access to simulcast information. And, uh, and then, you know, going back to that cadence, that heartbeat of your jigging motion, it's just such good visual language of what it took you to convert a fish. When you can see your, your cadence and how big your swings are, and what it took to convert on a, on a fish, it's easy to go back and replicate that when you get back down the hole. Yeah, the other thing I think that, uh, that I use it for is, you know, I like to look around and kind of daydream a little bit while I'm out there and being able to see that graph and seeing some movement that maybe I missed one second ago, it's nice to be able to just see that history over the last 10 or 15 seconds or whatever that you would not have with the regular flasher. If you miss it, it's gone. Yeah. So you, if, you're, if you're on your phone in the deer stand, you can hear a deer. But if, if you're checking your phone in the fish shack, it's nice to be able to look back, see that elevation change and go, oh, I'm, you know, oh, I missed one. And yeah. nine times out of 10, you can call that fish back. Yeah. Right. You get to see a lot of people using these products. What's probably the most common mistake that you see people uh, when they're using sonar? Uh, so there's so much personal preference to this. Um, I'm, I go a little bit ag uh, against the, the trend. I don't, you can always get a clearer view if your transducer is down below the ice. Um, I tend, if, if I can get away with it and the ice is, is good, if there's a lot of air bubbles in the ice, sonars don't like air. They're designed to read um, pulse width through water, right? Um, sound travels faster through air than it does through water. So if there's any air pockets or anything like that in the ice, um, you do want to get down below it. But in most cases, I like to hang my transducer as high up as I possibly can, um, especially with, you know, crappies or bluegills that have a tendency to have that circular bite as they come up the hole because they can they can wrap around your deucer um i would i would say this to you know the most common thing that i kind of see <laughs> sorry um 
I see out there is you want to treat your transducer like it's a egg at the end of an eight foot cord. The transducer is always going to be the most sensitive part of any sonar system. I see a lot of people dragging them from hole to hole. Um, you don't want to do that. You, know, you, you want to take good care of that transducer because that's, that's kind of the brains of your system. That's the thing that's sending and receiving and sending the information up into the head unit. So other than that, you know, I, I can't tell you how many people have a, you know, like an LX5 for, or excuse me, an M5, for example. Um, those have some advanced features that aren't hard to use. Um, super fine line is one of them. And super fine line basically is a way to bring the target separation in the entire water column down to three quarters of an inch. When you turn the unit on, that's the first button you should hit every time, no question. It's like going from standard definition to high definition. And a lot of people over the years have asked, why didn't Markham just do that at standard? Um, and back in the day, um, there was a perception that the smaller mark or the smaller return meant that it wasn't as sensitive as a system, where actually the opposite is true. So Markham put it in there as a feature. Um, and so I would just say, you know, one of the most common things I see is people that have systems and they're not using them to their to their full benefit. In the day of YouTube and podcasts and stuff like this, right, there's you know, it's normally a half hour video to get a full tutorial on the unit you have. Max it out, man. Very good. John, is there something that you wanted to talk about today that I didn't ask you about? I don't think so, man. I think you covered the, uh, the sonar category pretty good. I know you guys talk a lot um, to the wheelhouse market. And uh, the guys fishing in the hard checks, we talked a lot about bouncing around. I think there's a couple units out there that are, are uh, really good um, and more preferred for the wheelhouse angler. And one of, you know, one of those, we've got a, a sonar system that's called the LX9. Now it's piggybacked with a camera too. And it's kind of one of the only systems that has sonar and camera on one screen. You can overlay it. That, uh, that's where the fun starts because that one's got um, video out. So if you wanted to hook sonar up to the big screen um, in the house, just like everybody's doing with their cameras, you certainly can. And the, the nice part about that system is it can monitor two holes, one with the camera and one with the sonar. You know, so if you're out, uh, if you want to monitor multiple things, yeah, you certainly can. Yeah, very cool. That I've seen that in action, and uh, a lot of people in their wheelhouses like to hook that camera up and watch what's going on under the water. But uh, that LX9 gives you the opportunity to not just watch the camera, but watch your sonar on the big screen as well. And sometimes that neck, just from looking down all day, gets a little sore. So it's nice uh, to put that up on a big display. So. Very cool. John Marshall from Marshall and Hanson. Appreciate your time and uh, have a great season out there on the ice this year. You too, buddy.